In the eyes of 19th century Americans, the New World, their world, had no ruins or monuments, but it had something better, places like this, which proved that God had written the immensity of his designs right here in America. Nature, not culture, was what made Americans American. To experience in solitude what the novelist Fenimore Cooper called the holy calm of nature was a duty that became a right. And if they couldn't do it themselves, they wanted works of art that reminded them of it. sort of hard to take it all in. <laughs> I mean, it's awe-inspiring, that's for sure. It's one of the most beautiful places in the, I guess, in the whole world to me. I don't think anybody in the United States of America should, should not come see this. I look at it and I say that uh, it's just an example of a, of a great God that had a very creative hand in forming the, uh, in forming the earth and uh, giving us this opportunity really to see a fantastic part of his creation. You see people from other countries here because you can tell by their accents or they're talking different languages and you just kind of feel proud to be an American because I mean this is here, this is ours and we have preserved it. Landscape became the national subject, the sign of American identity. The painting of historical subjects was weak in America because artists feared that American history itself was thin. But God creates the landscape and it creates an American vision, primal, a theater of triumphs and conquests to come. The fashion for uplift in landscape started here. In the 1820s, cultivated New Yorkers came flocking to the Catskill Mountains and to this waterfall. They spoke of their trips as pilgrimages. They saw themselves as a congregation in the Church of Nature. The tourist arrived and stayed in a fair-sized hotel built at the top of the falls called the Mountain House. He paid 25 cents to some elderly gnome to operate a sluice gate and release the water over the falls. So what the tourist got was no longer wilderness, but a wilderness experience. Something that you appreciated aesthetically, but no longer had to struggle towards. Among the pilgrims to the mountain house was the artist Thomas Cole, whose views of the Catskills and the Falls were the first paintings to depict the American landscape as holy ground. In the beginning, all the world was America, John Locke had written in the 17th century, and Cole's images reflect this idea of America as the very prototype of nature with the solitary traveler as Adam. Cole inspired a whole generation of American landscape artists who became known as the Hudson River School. His work included scenes of Italian landscape based on Turner and Claude Lorraine, classical ruins, picturesque peasants, and the artist sketching them while a goat sneaks up to eat his jacket, a deflating touch almost worthy of Mark Twain.
but he believed European scenery was worn out, and his deeper attraction was to the Catskills, where, he said, the associations are of God the Creator. They are his undefiled works, and the mind is cast into the contemplation of eternal things. This could require some artistic license. This is Cole's Falls of the Catterskill. The leaves are turning red. It is autumn, peak viewing season. But he leaves out the tourists peering over the brink and puts in an Indian brave, posed exultantly, the last of the Mohicans, the spirit of the woods. But the Indians had long since been driven away and Cole was troubled by the raw, go-getting spirit of most Americans who saw landscape only as territory, raw material, not as a spiritual resource. For Cole, that seemed close to blasphemy. One of Cole's favourite images was that of pastoral, Arcadian American nature beset by storms, which pass, but their presence suggests a kind of disturbance in the world and maybe even in society, and so it is with his big picture called the Oxbow, a view of a bend in the Connecticut River looking down from the top of Mount Holyoke. It's split almost into two parts. On the right, you have that serene golden light, the settlements and the quiet curve of the river, and don't forget that an oxbow was a yoke. It was a symbol of domination over raw nature. And on the left, you have nature which is uncontrollable, the storm blowing up out of the valley, and in the foreground, the reminders of earlier storms in the form of those blasted trees. And finally, as a little note on the right, you have the artist's umbrella planted like a kind of flag. He himself has retreated. You can just see him down in the gully working on his picture, but he's leaving the moral decoding of the scene to us. <laughs> Deep in the woods of North Carolina, an extremist eco-group called Earth First bewails the violation of American nature. I want to mourn the loss of all the old growth trees I and tell them that we love them and that we don't want them to die that there are some people here who do care so i want you to know that trees that we care i think we are deeply hurting in america I think we are deeply craving answers. I think that we've lost our identity as we have evolved into technology and into industrialized society. Bring me to this cathedral. Bring me to those guys. Bring me to this rock that has the most incredible life. That makes me feel alive. I've looked at clear cuts and burnt forest and I've felt outraged, but I didn't scream and I didn't cry. And I need to. Ah! This fear of the vanishing wilderness goes back a long way. In the 1830s, the French visitor Alexis de Tocqueville remarked with uncanny insight that it is the consciousness of destruction of swift and inevitable change that gives such a touching beauty to the solitudes of America. One sees them with a kind of melancholy pleasure. One is in some sort of a hurry to admire them. Now this created a conflict for Americans because on the one hand the land was seen as an enormous cornucopia of natural resources that you could do anything with that you wanted. On the other, it's God's fingerprint to be preserved and revered at all costs. By the mid-century, other painters identified Cole with the American landscape whose meanings he'd unveiled. There he is in the painting by his friend Asher Durand called Kindred Spirits. He's on the right, showing the works of the supreme being to the poet and journalist William Cullen Bryant.
The appetite for images of pristine American nature was not restricted to landscape alone. The year 1838 saw the publication of an immense portfolio of prints entitled The Birds of America. It documented, mostly at life size, over a thousand individual species of bird. The artist, John James Audubon, called it his great idea, and it was. There he is, clambering between the crowd.